Nam. I'm the director of the new MA in Theories of Urban Practice. This lecture series, the Urban Colloquium, is co-sponsored by the two new graduate urban programs in Parsons, the MS Design and Urban Ecologies and the MA Theories of Urban Practice. And one of the themes of these programs, which ties into today's talk, is uh, who do we design cities for? And uh, a lot of what you see in uh, mainstream practice, in mainstream programs, tend to be designed for, like for example, the high profile projects, uh, for those who are privileged, those who are wealthy, those who are powerful, uh, and often forgotten in that sort of mainstream type of urban practice are those who are less privileged, who don't have uh, equal access to resources. And we are very fortunate that in New York, there's some terrific organizations doing great work and really having a huge influence on shaping the city. And we are very lucky to have one of them here tonight. Uh, tonight's speaker is Brenda Rosen. She's the executive director of Common Ground, which is the renowned nonprofit organization in New York City that is celebrated nationally and internationally for its success in the provision of supportive housing to homeless, disabled, elderly, and low-income people. Founded in 1990, Common Ground is the biggest supportive housing provider in the nation and operates more than 2,700 units of permanent supportive housing across New York City. Brenda Rosen has devoted her career to the issue of homelessness, first as an attorney in New York City's Department of Homeless Services, and later as director of the Prince George Hotel, Common Ground's then newest supportive housing development. Brenda studied sociology and urban studies at Hunter College in New York, and later at Benjamin Cardoso Law School, which she just told me is actually just across the street from here. So please join me in welcoming Brenda Rosen. Um, hi everyone. Um, my, my colleague Beth is here with me. She's gonna she's gonna help me with the PowerPoint because uh, I'm PowerPoint. Um, disabled, and, uh, and we'd be on slide number one throughout the entire presentation if she wasn't here. Um, two other colleagues are actually with me, um, Carol and Keith, so uh, I was saying that if you have uh, questions at the end of the uh, discussion, they'll be happy to, to help me answer them. Um, but welcome, uh, I mean, thank you for having me today. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Common Ground. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, in primarily in New York City, although we do have some properties outside of New York City. Um, so, so today the, the agenda for the, the conversation is really to talk about what Common Ground's story is, uh, what our mission is, what our model is, um, how we use partnerships to ensure our success. And then I, I think it's helpful to have an example and, and, and talk through an example to make it real. So we're going to talk about one of our newest buildings called the Hegeman, which is in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And then I'm going to touch on how we work with others to help shape policy in New York City. Um, and the influence that Common Ground is having beyond uh, New York. So hopefully at the end of the presentation, um, we, you'll see how, how uh, we help and, and we overcome barriers and challenges and how we can make them into uh, opportunities. And, uh, and I hope to, to show you that um, housing for low-income and formerly homeless individuals um, does not have to be uh, thought of as institutional, that uh, there's no need to have uh, NIMBY when, when uh, organizations like us are, are developing. And, and uh, hopefully I'll be introducing to you, some of you to a model of housing that you're not familiar with, but, hope, but uh, likely will become more familiar with as, uh, as we go along. And, and if you live in New York City, you'll be, you'll be passing our buildings and, and, know, and know from now on that they're common ground. So um, our story, uh, uh, as was said, um, was we were founded in 1990, uh, and our mission was to create attractive, sa safe, and uh, well-managed supportive housing for low-income and formerly homeless New Yorkers. Uh, we also um, do outreach, did outreach, and continue to do outreach on the streets to those that are, that are homeless. 
And we, besides having permanent housing, developing it and operating it, we also operate transitional housing for chronically homeless individuals, for veterans and, and other populations. And that's temporary housing until folks move into uh, more permanent supportive housing or, or other housing. Um, quickly, uh, we started um, with one building in 1990. There is a, a hotel on the corner of 43rd and 8th called the Times Square Hotel, which was built in 1923 as a, as a really upscale hotel. Um, by the 1980s, it was a dilapidated welfare hotel. Um, I don't know how many of you were around in the 1980s, but the Times Square area was very drug-ridden, and uh, the Times Square Hotel was uh, quite participatory in, in drug sales and other activity that was going on in the neighborhood. In 1990, Common Ground was formed technically to save that particular site and develop it into supportive housing, which is, and I'll go into that a bit more later, but supportive housing very quickly is permanent housing for uh, special needs uh, people and low income people. Special needs can be defined different ways. Um, at Common Ground, um, we uh, accept people that are chronically homeless from the streets, those that have severe and persistent mental illness, those that have HIV AIDS, substance abuse disorders, and oftentimes co-occurring disorders. So you have mental illness and substance abuse disorders. Really a lot of uh, significant barriers to housing and that's uh, many of the reasons that lead people to having years, decades out on the streets. Um, they have complicated histories that lead them to, to life on the streets. Uh, we renovated this building. It cost about $50 million to renovate, and we turned it into uh, the uh, single largest supportive housing residence in the United States, and that uh, is the single largest one uh, to date. It has 652 studio apartments, so it is uh, a world unto itself in that building. Um, the population is um, uh, the blended mix of low-income working individuals uh, and the formerly homeless with all of the, the issues that I, I spoke about just a few minutes ago. Um, and, the, and it's about a 60-40 break, uh, meaning 60% of the units are for special needs folks and 40% are for low income. Uh, the renovation uh, was very, very expensive, and uh, the financing was, was very complex. Um, uh, in 1986, there was a federal program developed called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and that's basically, that's in existence today, and it's a very important program, and it's essentially where private investors get tax breaks for, for investing directly into the development of low income housing. Um, so we, we took advantage of that program and uh, uh, put that together with several other funding sources to, to renovate the building. Um, so these are just a few slides from the, the uh, Times Square. The one on the left is we have a very large, beautiful lobby, um, and that's one of the, the stairways, uh, stairways that leads up to the mezzanine where we have... Uh, art and, and lots of other activities that go on for the tenants. Um, on the upper right is uh, we have a, a multi-purpose room and outdoor gardens up on, on our uh, highest floor and we hold dinners there at holidays and such. People have their own leases, they're independent, but so, so we don't provide meals, but we do do lots of things to bring the tenants together. So that's a, that's a photo from one of our meals. And then uh, below that is, is a picture of a typical apartment. The Times Square is, was a rehabbed, um, uh, you know, old hotel. So we, it's not new development. So it's not, the apartments aren't as um, uh, fancy as, as uh, our newer developments where we are, have become quite, uh, developed quite an expertise in small space design. But they are... Um, they are affordable and clean and really well taken care of and, uh, and right in the heart of Times Square. So it's completely uh, helped to change the neighborhood. Um, our story now. So uh, in 1990, we were one building. Um, today, we are 16 buildings um, with um, a total of about 3,200 apartments, including transitional and permanent housing. Um, and so we, we've grown quite a bit, and we have a robust development pipeline at all times. So we are always looking for new sites and uh, looking to, to, to grow. Um, we are focused on, on the five boroughs, but we have, have done development outside. 
Um, this slide, and say this, this shows, wait, which one does this show, Beth? This shows the, where we're located in, in the five boroughs, and then uh, the little bubble above, where the number nine is, uh, is our uh, uh, Transitional housing for veterans. We have a two-year program on a VA campus for formerly homeless veterans about an hour north of here in, in a, a town con called Montrose, New York. And then the other two buildings that we have, or the other three buildings, I'm sorry, we have one in Rochester, New York and that we just opened this year. And we have two in Connecticut, one in Hartford and one in a small town called Willimantic. Um, and uh, we opened that as well this year. So um, uh, although our future growth is going to be within the five boroughs, we, we have expanded, expanded beyond New York City. So this is um, just a slide which kind of gives an overview of what Common Ground does. Um, we have what we call our continuum of help. And we, Common Ground starts on the streets where, where quite literally we have um, staff that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to go out on the streets of all of, all of Queens, all of Brooklyn, and about a third of Manhattan to find homeless people. And we uh, go out, find those people, um, build relationships of trust with those people that can take days, weeks, months, years, um, and work with folks to bring them inside. So the, the goal is to, to uh, help somebody get from the streets to home. The program is called Street to Home. Um, and, uh, you know, we will do whatever and take as long as it takes to, to get somebody inside. So there are people that have been on the streets for two years. There are people that have been on the streets for 22 years. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, they will not come inside at all until they are, they, they are permanently housed. So they literally bring their shopping cart and whatever they have from the streets into their permanent home. And so during that period, uh, we will go out um, to check on them in all types of weather. We will go out to work with them on all of the paperwork that they need because unfortunately it's not simple. Um, so uh, we will go out and bring medical doctors to them on the streets, what, whatever it takes. Um, and, and then there are other times where we can bring folks in quicker and, and uh, put them into some sort of temporary housing while we work with them again on everything from getting ID and, and you know, their birth certificate and all the things that unfortunately you have to show to uh, receive permanent housing and the, and the subsidies, the Section 8 or whatever else you need to, to live um, stably in our permanent housing. Um, we'll be working with you to do that and also working on your, your mental health, medication monitoring, everything that you need, whether, uh, whatever it is, um, we're going to be working with you on it. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, we, we work with you to, be, uh, to become permanently housed, whether that's in common ground housing or in other housing. We don't have enough housing, unfortunately, to house all the folks that, that need help. So there are other wonderful nonprofits out there that we work with to um, share housing resources. Uh, this is a, a slide with a photo of uh, three of our transitional housing sites. Um, in, the, in the center is the, the one that I said was about an hour north of here um, on the VA campus, uh, which, uh, which has 96 units for um, formerly homeless veterans. Um, the two uh, ones on the side, the Andrews and the Jamaica Safe Haven, uh, those, are, those are called safe havens. They are a new model of temporary housing in New York City. So. Uh, probably most of you know that New York City has shelters. If you're homeless, you can go to shelters in the city, and New York State is required to provide you temporary housing in a shelter um, if, you are, if you are homeless. It's actually in the, in the state constitution. 
Um, there is a, a percentage of people that will not utilize the shelter system for various reasons. Um, they've gone into the shelter system, they've had bad experiences, uh, there, there are too many rules, uh, there's a curfew. If you don't come back by curfew, you, miss, you lose your bed. A lot of different things. And so there is a population of, of people that simply can't succeed in the shelter system. Um, a few years ago, about 2007, the city developed what they called the safe haven model, which basically was an alternative to the traditional shelter. And it is uh, a shelter with um, very few rules. You can't be violent, you can't bring weapons on site, and you can't use drugs or alcohol on site. Besides that, there is no curfew. Um, services are, vo are voluntary. And you can come in drunk, high, whatever. The, the goal is to get you inside. And what we have found is that as soon as we can get you inside and working with and engaged with our, our social workers and our case wor workers that the success rate to, to enable people to move on and stay with us is very high. So again, none of the services are voluntary and we don't force you to become clean and sober to come into the housing because uh, if that were the case, a lot of people wouldn't come inside because they're not ready for that yet. Um, so we employ what's called a harm reduction model, which basically means that if we bring you inside and if you work with us that over time the things that have been causing you the problems the the addictions that you have will decrease and um uh, it, it's also called when, it, when we talk about permanent housing we are an organization that firmly believes in what's called a housing first philosophy Again, that is a simple concept that stable housing is the beginning to everything. So if we can, if we can get you stably housed, that is the, um, the, the beginning of success for an individual. And we, supportive housing is stable housing with supports wrapped around it. That, um, and, uh, and so again, we don't require, some nonprofits do, we do not require uh, any sort of uh, clean, we have no clean and sober requirement to come into our house into our uh, uh, organization. So, uh, so presently, we are New York's largest provider of supportive houser, housing. We're a huge uh, developer. We develop and we operate supportive housing. We are uh, the largest provider of street outreach. As I said, the city contracts to different organizations to go out every day and every night to work with homeless people. And we hold the contract for all of Brooklyn, all of Queens, and about a third of Manhattan. We continue to focus on the chronically homeless. That means that there are homeless people that suffer from short-term bouts of instability. Um, they may couch surf, they may be homeless for a short amount of time. They may go into the shelter system and, and, uh, and, and receive sufficient help and, and then get back on their feet. That is not our primary focus. Our focus is on those that are long-term homeless people that have been entrenched in homelessness and have and are considered the most vulnerable people out on the streets. Um, and our goal is, is to get them off the streets and help them succeed. Um, and then most recently, um, we have expanded our focus on affordable housing as a means of homelessness prevention. Um, so uh, over the last year, uh, Common Ground took stock of what the needs were in, in the city, the evolving needs, and, and took a step back and said, how can we have greater impact and what should we do? We know that we're very good at developing buildings, and we know that we're very good at operating buildings and being great property managers um, and working with our, our partners to, to um, help people become stable. But we embarked on a six-month strategic planning process and did a lot of work on developing kind of a five-year strategic roadmap um, to help us figure out um, what we should continue doing, what we should stop, and what we should expand on. Um, and we, ha we revised our, our, both our business model and our mission statement, which is now to strengthen individuals, families, and communities by developing, sustaining, exceptional supportive housing, and, uh, supportive and affordable housing, as well as programs for homeless and other vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, 
In the strategic planning process, we spent a lot of time doing a lot of research on what was going on in the city. And we took three particular neighborhoods, um, the South Bronx, East New York and Brooklyn, and Jamaica, Queens, and wanted to know um, whether there was sufficient affordable housing in those neighborhoods to meet the need. And uh, we researched with, with help from a lot of other organizations and, and uh, McKinsey consultants, researched um, what, uh, what the number of people that were living in overcrowded situations and or paying more than 50% of their income towards rent every month and at risk of homelessness, living paycheck to paycheck, so they, you know, they can't make, they lose their job, they're, they're going to be homeless the next month, uh, what the numbers were in these particular neighborhoods and what the availability of affordable housing was. And affordable housing, you normally pay, say, 30% of your income towards rent. And what we found was that there is no surplus uh, of affordable housing in New York. In the South Bronx, there, 6% of the demand um, is being met. In East New York, 9% of the demand. And in Jamaica, Queens, less than 1% of the demand. Um, we also reached out to stakeholders in all of the communities, elected officials, community board members, um, tenant associations, uh, and asked them what they thought both of common ground and of uh, the need for additional affordable housing in their neighborhoods and whether they would welcome that addition. And, and the, the answers were varied. Um, in East New York, essentially, they said, we need a lot of help and we welcome uh, we welcome new organizations coming in to, to help us meet this, this growing need. Uh, in the South Bronx, they, they said that there was a, a, di a, a great need for, for su subsidized housing and that um, the South Bronx is, is changing a lot and that a lot of the housing that's coming in is actually not affordable. In Jamaica, Queens, which was really interesting, uh, th there were not a lot of, uh, there was not a lot of positive feedback. Um, then we have one quote up there, but we have had um, a lot of difficulty trying to build in Queens, and uh, and basically um, uh, it, it is uh, an interesting borough to try to go and, and develop both supportive and affordable housing. We have um, transitional housing in Queens, and we do the outreach in Queens, so it makes sense to us to have buildings in Queens, to have homes for those people, but, uh, but it, it is definitely a challenge. Um, we also looked at, besides the, the need for just uh, more homes for people in these particular neighborhoods, what other impact could, have, could the development of affordable housing have on, on communities? And so our you know, pretty little chart shows that um, with each of our buildings, we have employment opportunities, um, both on, in construction and permanent positions. Normally about half of our positions now are filled by folks from, from the, the community within which the, the building is developed. Um, there are many statistics that say that sh that demonstrate that households in poverty are much more likely to have social ser child social service involvement and and um, children in foster care. So um, again, the the best one of the the best ways to to prevent the, more of this from happening is building affordable housing. Um, the other thing that, that, that we add to the community when we go in and develop is that we take underutilized. Um, uh, avail uh, underutilized space and b build beautiful buildings. So the building in Brooklyn um, was uh, the one that we have up here in downtown Brooklyn, right near BAM, was on a, a, v a vacant piece of land. So we were able to uh, transform it into a, a beautiful building. Uh, the building that I'm specifically going to talk about shortly was an underutilized parking lot, which when we did the ribbon cutting, we had lots of elected officials there. The councilman said that he had grown up in Brownsville and that the, the space that he was standing on when he was a child was the, the kind of shortcut that you'd run through to get home from school and it would just be rampant with drug dealers. So, and now, now there's a, a beautiful building and some gardens there. And in all of our buildings, we try to 
build something in for the community. So for example, um, uh, we'll have retail space or community facility space. In our building in Brooklyn, we have two spaces. In, in downtown Brooklyn, we have two spaces. One space that has the Brooklyn Ballet. Um, so if you walk by the, the building, you'll see adorable children in tutus. Um, and we rent that out at cost at a, n a nonprofit rate to the organization, the Brooklyn Ballet. And inside the building, we actually have a black box theater that is as beautiful as any Broadway theater that you'd walk into. And um, we use that both for tenants and for the community at large. So, you know, downtown Brooklyn by BAM is very artsy. There's um, dance groups, musical groups, all sorts of, of organizations that can't afford to find rehearsal space and performance space. That space uh, is, is rented out at cost to community groups to, to utilize. Um, so our model, in, in short, is that uh, we... Um, we want to ensure uh, stable housing for people that come into our buildis, buildings so that our services and approach in total is geared towards keeping people stably housed. We have um, all sorts of, uh, I call them amenities, but they're, um, uh, they're wonderful additions to every one of our buildings um, to engage folks. What we, what we think of it as, uh, we think of it as building community inside the building and then bringing the public and the community at large into our buildings. So with a building of 652 people or another one of our buildings that has 416 people, um, many of whom have been by themselves, not engaged with other individuals for years and years. Our goal is not only to, to give them a place to live and, and, and a bed to sleep on every night, but our goal is to integrate them into mainstream society. So we have to help give them the tools to do that. And one of the ways that we do it is to have um, activities and an entire department in our buildings called the Tenant Services Department where, ten where the activities, workshops, classes are all geared around um, engaging tenants, bringing them out of their apartments, learning new skills, everything from art therapy, to yoga, to knitting, to cooking classes, uh, financial literacy, resume writing, you name it, we have it. Um, and that is to help people succeed in their housing and help them relate to each other. Um, all of these are available for both of our, uh, our formerly homeless tenants and our low-income working tenants. So when I, and just, just to, for context, when I say low-income working, um, that can be anywhere from, say, $15,000 to about $34,000. Um, so, you know, it's a, a really uh, wonderful opportunity for somebody who is, uh, you know, has a, has a job but is, uh, you know, not making six figures or anywhere close to that. Um, Uh, oh, uh, so on the top, I, I talked about the, the ballet classes um, in, our, in our Brooklyn building. Um, we also have uh, in our Prince George uh, building, which is on 28th between Madison and 5th, we have a, a ballroom that was renovated. Again, the, the Prince George is another one of our building that, buildings that was a dilapidated hotel. Um, it had been this upscale hotel in the early 1900s and then turned into a welfare hotel where families, uh, families of four were living in uh, studio apartments of 300 square feet. Um, and we renovated the building and brought it back to its original splendor. And in that building was, is a very large ballroom. Um, at the time in the 1980s when it was a welfare hotel, it was actually used as a basketball court for the kids that were living in the building. It was completely run down, and, and hindsight, I wish we had a photo of the before. Um, but what we had was a, a campaign where we raised about a million dollars and had volunteers come in and paint um, every single part of the ballroom that you see there, um, uh, gold leaf and, and all of it, um, to bring it back to uh, the way it looked in, in 1910. And we used that ballroom to rent out to organizations, to not-for-profit partners, to corporations. We hold weddings, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs. Uh, the Housewives of New York City reunion was filmed there. Um, 
Yes, that's our big claim to fame, actually. I turned on the TV and I said, oh my god, that's, uh, that's my ballroom. Um, and uh, we use all of the proceeds from the ballroom to go straight back into uh, Common Ground programming. So uh, this is a business for us, but only to promote the, the work that we do. Another part of what we do um, and what is crucial to the success of Common Ground, and I'd venture to say any successful nonprofit in this business, is we have very, very effective partnerships. I always um, steal the phrase from Hillary Clinton about it takes a village. It takes a, a village to ensure the sa safety and success of our tenants. And um, we we realize that we do not we are not experts in every in every single thing. So we partner oftentimes with other nonprofits to live in the buildings with us and provide the social services. We don't provide all of the social services in all of our programs. We do in some, but not all. And in many of our buildings, there are other nonprofit organizations that uh, have offices on the, on the residential floors and work with all of the tenants. Again, completely voluntary, open to both the formerly homeless and low-income individuals. So if you need help, it's, it's right on site. Um, uh, partnerships are unbelievably important, not only inside the building to ensure that tenants are getting the best of the best with respect to services, um, but very important, especially as we've grown and developed in the outer boroughs. I, I talked about NIMBY being an issue. Um, having a local partner going into a neighborhood in Queens or Brooklyn or the Bronx and being able to w work with a nonprofit that's well known in that area and uh, is, is key to success sometimes. So, so in the Bronx, there's an organization called Bronx Works that if you ask people in the Bronx, do they know of, that many, most people have heard of them and think very highly of them. They uh, work and live in one of our buildings with us in the Bronx. Um, partnerships are also incredibly important when it comes to financing a project and making it happen. N um, not only do, uh, do we have to work with our government partners and put a very complex financial package together, but more, uh, more and more, there are big, development, uh, big developments going on in the city of which we want supportive housing to be a part of. So in downtown Brooklyn, um, we built a building that was incorporated into a much larger for-profit development. There were two or three blocks in, down um, now near the new Net Stadium that um, that were being developed into market rate high, you know, uh, market rate rentals and and other types of uh, retail spaces. And what we did was work with the community and work with the stakeholders and the partners in that area to say, come get to know Common Ground. You know, after you get to know us, you're going to want to give us a parcel of land and work with us so that we can build a building there. And then partnerships continue to be important um, every day while while operating the building. So um, we get we work tirelessly to to be good neighbors, and that means to to work with the police precincts, to work with the community boards, to work with the elected officials. Um, our goal is to to uh, kind of be the best neighbor that we can be because we want to show communities that we're an asset and we you shouldn't be afraid of having this type of housing in your neighborhood. So I, I said I was going to talk about one particular building. Hegeman is in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And this was our ribbon cutting that we had um, just back in, in September. And in that photo, uh, we have um, commissioners from from HPD, Housing Preservation Development, Department of Homeless Services, um, uh, 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 Office of Temporary Disability Assistance, we have our social service partner, we have our banking partner. Um, it is really, um, like I said, it, it, takes, uh, it takes all of those people and organizations and support to be able to put together a project like this. Um, this is a, a photo of one of the sides of, of Hegeman. Um, it is, uh, uh, we are, it was our second housing development in Brooklyn. It was designed by architects called Cook Plus Fox. They're, they are um, incredibly well-known architects. They designed the Bank of America building in Midtown, which is LEED Platinum. And uh, Common Ground is fortunate enough to be very 
to have the opportunity to work with world-renowned architects on, on building design. Um, in addition to the outreach and the services and, and, uh, and all of the things that we provide, good design is incredibly important to, to Common Ground, whether it be rehabbing an old building or new construction, uh, being green and sustainable and LEED certified, um, along with being absolutely beautiful, is very, very important to us. We set the bar quite high. Um, no building looks like any other building. Each of them is, is quite distinctive. And, and basically, our, our belief is that in order to um, promote the well-being of our tenants, we want to give them a beautiful place to live. So we want you to walk into the lobby of the building and say, wow, I can't believe that I live here every day. Um, the staff takes enormous pride in keeping the buildings absolutely spotless. Um, and uh, so we take a lot of time to, to make sure that the design for the building is, is well done. Uh, this is another, this is a rendering of the, of the building. Um, on to the next one. This is uh, just one of the one of the construction photos. Uh, th this building, like I said, is we expect to lead uh, certification, probably of silver, maybe gold, but probably silver. And we have um, uh, really some some quite unique green designs in this building. For example, um, as you come into, uh, let's see if the next. Uh, well, let's go to the next slide. So so. Um, uh, we, we make sure in all of our new construction that we have very large windows, that there is a lot of natural light that flows not only into the apartments but into the hallways um, as, as much as possible. Our materials are, are, are recycled um, from the, the concrete blocks that we use in the exterior brick to the, the flooring, which is marmoleum, not linoleum. It's the green version of, of linoleum. Um, and uh, there we go. That's another view. If you go, um, this uh, this is one of our green roofs on the buildings. Uh, on the building, it's in its infancy, so it'll grow a lot larger. Uh, but the green roofs uh, absorb storm water. They re reduce the amount released in the into the city system. They help keep the underlying roof cooler in the summer, and they help maintain the heat within the building in the winter. Um, so, so green roofs are, are very important to us. Uh, this is another view of the green roof. We also have a solar panel, um, and you'll notice that the underlying roof is white to reflect rather than absorb the sun, which reduces, uh, reduces the heat in the summer. This is a, a, a photo of a, a typical apartment at the Hegemon. Um, our apartments are small. They range in our older buildings from about 120 square feet um, to over 400, but the typical new construction is about 270 square feet, so they're actually called mini studios. So Common Ground is an expert in small space design. Um, our goal is to take this very small space and turn it into a really efficient living area. Um, so. Uh, uh, and and this is and this is what we we specialize in. Um, the uh, in this particular apart apartment, the the L shape divides the space into both a living room and a bedroom area and a kitchen area um, to, that maximizes storage. So you, whenever you go into our, our new construction, particularly, you'll find that that there's um, uh, storage every everywhere that you look. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about in, in terms of being green and sustainable uh, and the features that I like in a few of our new buildings is as you come into the lobbies of our buildings, you have to go through turnstiles. So there's security desk. We always have 24-hour security, front desk staff, and you have an ID and, and you swipe your, oh, there we go, and, and you swipe your uh, ID right on the turnstile. When you're leaving the building, you swipe as well. And when you leave the building, that signifies we have a building management system which uh, turns off all non-essential power in your apartment. So we pay for uh, many of the uh, special needs tenants, and obviously the low-income tenants want to keep their costs low, uh, utility costs for many of them. And so in the summer, 
uh, people have a tendency or can have a tendency to leave their air conditioners on all day. If you walk out of the building here and you swipe your, your uh, card, which will open the turnstile so you can leave, your air conditioner will shut off. When you come back into the building and you swipe your, your ID to get back in the building, your air conditioner turns on right away. Um, so it's one of the, the ways that we have cut down on utility costs and been a lot more efficient. Um, and then all of our, our buildings have uh, light sensors and motion, motion uh, sensors so that the, the lights go on and off depending on, on where you're walking. Um, so uh, these are the, just two photos of we have uh, a gym and a computer room in all of our buildings. And, uh, and, and these are just samples of, of what we have. We hold computer classes, and people can, can use the, the gym and com, uh, computer rooms basically whenever they want. Um, we have other rooms in different buildings. We have rehearsal rooms and, and uh, other, other types of things for folks. But these are just two examples. This is a, another picture of Hegemann. This is the community garden that we have. So uh, the, the tenant garden, I'm sorry. So this is the back of the building. And we have a very large, beautiful garden for, for tenant use and tenant uh, programming. We do a lot of things out, outside for the tenants there. And, um, and this is a view of uh, bike storage. We have bike storage in almost every one of our new buildings as well. It uh, promotes green and uh, and is, uh, is, a, is a really helpful for both tenants and for staff. Um, in addition to our garden that we have for the tenants in our building, just adjacent to that garden is another space, which is um, down on your lower right. Uh, and it is not built out yet, but we are fundraising um, as I speak um, to, bu to build out a community garden. So I was saying earlier that when we go into a neighborhood, we want to have as much impact as possible on the community in a positive way. So yes, we come in and we pick a block that is you know, a, a vacant lot or an underutilized space and we build a beautiful building that we hope um, will and are sure will add value to the neighborhood and we're good neighbors and we have homes for people. But we also want to affect the people that don't live in the building. So um, along with the space, like I said, for the, the Brooklyn Ballet, and, and for folks to rehearse in and perform in. In this building, we have what will be a, a community garden. And what we did before we even put a shovel on the ground to build the building was reach out to the community and say, what would you be interested in having if we could have um, things for you? So we do have quite an extensive, whoops, schematic um, that, is, that shows what our uh, community garden uh, will look like when we're done. And, uh, you know, and it'll be open to, to the neighborhood. In addition, what, one of the other things that we have in this building, um, I said we always have workshops and, you know, resume writing, art, everything. Uh, we received a, a multi-year grant to not only offer all of those services to people that live in the building, but to also offer to neighbors outside. So you lose your job, you live across the street, and you want to help finding a new job, and you need to help, have help writing your resume, you can come on into our building, and, and we have staff that will help you do that. Um, so again, the, the program design um, at Hegeman is similar to, to our other buildings, where we link tenants to resources and opportunities in the community. Um, we, uh, the, the success rate at Common Ground is quite high, so we do a lot of um, data collection and evaluation, and, uh, and our benchmarks are high. For example, uh, we aim to always have higher than a 97% occupancy rate, a 98% rent collection rate, and a less than 1% eviction rate, and that's because eviction is absolutely our last uh, course of action. We will. Uh, do virtually anything to help you maintain your housing. Uh, so I thought I'd talk a bit about, bes besides um, common ground and, and the specific uh, buildings that we build and the impact that we have on, on communities and on people, uh, we, since we are the largest supportive housing developer in, in New York, uh, we do a lot of work 
to help shape policy and, policy and work with the, our government partners, uh, both in the city and in the state, to effect new policy to, to uh, promote more development of supportive housing. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but right now we're going undergoing quite a huge change with respect to Medicaid in New York State. Um, things are, are changing very rapidly. And one of the things that, that New York State has done, and uh, I believe we're at the forefront of, of kind of the change and leading the way, is that what we've known anecdotally for years in this, build, in this business is that when you take folks that have been on the streets without a home um, and bring them into supportive housing, you reduce costs on other services. So uh, you may have been using the emergency room um, as your de facto home when it was really cold outside. Uh, you have a lot of calls to the police and, and fire department and uh, people are calling 911 and you're you know, constantly being brought to, to the ER. Those are all really, really expensive public services. And when you come into supportive housing, those costs drop. You have services on site. You have a warm, a warm place to, to call home. And, uh, and the cost to the city and to the state um, is, is reduced. And what New York did this year for the first time ever was put $60 million into the state budget um, under uh, Medicaid redesign. That's what they're calling it. And it is to develop and operate supportive housing for the exact people that I've been talking about, the people that have been diagnosed with severe and persistent mental illness that live out on the streets. Because New York State recognizes that, in fact, they'll end up saving money if they help uh, support the development and operation of supportive housing. Um, uh, Common Ground and, and, and our other nonprofit partners were very, very... Uh, participatory in the process in negotiating with the state and, and making that become a reality. We belong to uh, several different networks that do um, uh, in, in incredible advocacy work both in the city, state, and down in DC on the federal levels to ensure that, uh, that funding um, is maintained uh, and not eliminated, and if it's reduced, it's not reduced. Um, as much as as, as uh, first thought to be. Uh, unfortunately, as each passing year goes on with the budget issues um, here and in Washington, funding is is declining. But so it only uh, means that we have to work harder to to uh, to maintain it. And uh, and we do. We are regularly advocating, going up and providing testimony um, in front of uh, various groups of elected officials. And we also show off our buildings everywhere. And, um, and uh, we do it both because we love to and want to say this is successful and you should support it uh, and because it, it really works. So um, we welcome anybody at any time, especially those that, that can influence policy, to come in and take a tour of our buildings, meet our tenants, meet our staff, and see what we're doing. Uh, because once you come into one of our buildings and you see what it looks like and what it feels like, you're, uh, you're, you're sold on the, on the model. I, I, uh, I don't know anybody that hasn't walked out and said this is uh, fair, you know, pretty fantastic. Um, beyond New York, we have a, a reputation that goes uh, beyond the five boroughs. Uh, in Australia, for example, there is Australia Common Ground. There is also New Zealand Common Ground. We're very, very popular down under, um, and uh, and we are we are constantly being visited by people in other countries um, that come and spend time with us and shadow our staff to see what our model is like and why it's successful. And uh, and it, you know it's uh, it's kind of a side business for us, but we're more than happy to do it because it helps promote the the model. And uh, if people want to replicate what we're doing. Uh, we're more than happy to give them the tools to do that. So kind of the, the lessons learned, I, I'd say, from this is that uh, good design meets both the needs of the consumer and the community at large. Again, um, uh, you know, I could go on for days about, about what our buildings look like and, and, uh, and, and how they're, they're maintained, but it is definitely uh, key to, to common ground success. Um, 
partnerships are absolutely critical. Like I said, we couldn't do this. We, we don't work in a vacuum. Uh, so uh, we have to work with partners in every uh, imaginable way. When, uh, you know, for three years before the building is, is, is occupied, we have to put the financing package together. We have to find the investors. Uh, and, and people have to believe in us to invest in us. So uh, it's taken a long time to ensure that, that we have the reputation that we do. Um, and we work with social service partners and partners in the communities within which we develop to ensure that we're good neighbors and that everybody, the tenants and the people um, that live around the building are getting the, the most that they can get out of, out of common ground. Uh, and that uh, we've also learned to uh, really evaluate and assess each of our projects. Um, they're difficult, they're complicated, and uh, we don't do everything perfectly. Um, one of the things that we um, are going to be doing over the next five years is really take a critical look at ensuring that, uh, that our model remains sustainable and viable. Uh, we don't want to do something that you know is, is a one-off and others won't be able to do or that uh, depends on funding that you know will not be around in a few years. So, so it's, uh, it's very important to, to look back backwards and say, well, this worked, this didn't work. You know, let's do this again, let's not do this again. Um, so this, uh, you know, we thought we'd put a plug in for Common Ground here. And, uh, and so this is our, our website. And we're now on uh, Facebook. We weren't uh, until Beth came along. We, we didn't know what Facebook was. Uh, and we're on Twitter as well. Um, and, uh, and so I welcome you to, to take a, a, a look, a, a kind of a closer look at Common Ground um, and, and get to know us. And, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll see some of you in the future. <laughs> so thanks very much. And please wait to get the microphone before you ask the question. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your housing population and some of the data that you've gathered? Because you mentioned the data you've gathered like in terms of how many people move on, like how long do tenants stay? Um, and also in terms of I know it seems like you're growing and growing and growing larger and larger, but does there come a point where like scalability kind of gets too much and you need to return to that relationship building piece um, mm -hmm. and kind of reconnecting with all the people who live there? Um, so. Sure, sure. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the second pers part first, and then I'm gonna ask my uh, colleague to come up and and talk about the first part a little bit. Um, but uh, in, in terms of scalability, uh, that is definitely something that we looked at when we were doing our strategic plan. And one of the things that I failed to mention was that um, what we have also decided to do, so, so as you saw uh, Beth's map, you know, we have a few buildings here, a few buildings there, and it adds up to a lot of buildings. But what we have to be more deliberate about um, is uh, uh, making sure that we can develop more buildings in particular neighborhoods uh, for several reasons. Number one, uh, as I said, funding continues to decline. So the best way to be able to share resources is if you have two buildings two blocks away from each other. When you have a building in Brownsville and a building in the South Bronx, it's complicated. Um, so we are going to be more thoughtful about seeking sites uh, to build on that so that we can cluster our buildings. Not only does that allow for operational efficiencies, but it also allows us to have more of a presence in the neighborhood on, on kind of a local level. Um, so whether it be to supportive housing buildings or supportive housing building and affordable housing building, uh, we plan to, to grow in particular areas. Um, so, and, and that uh, we feel very strongly will allow us to, to, to not become too big um, and, and to be, have thoughtful growth. Um, but, so I'm just gonna put you totally on the spot. So this is Keith, and uh, I'll let Keith introduce himself. He wasn't coming to participate, but he's, uh, he's our data person, so I'm just gonna let him talk. 
at all of our buildings, and one of the strong points of Common Ground is kind of the um, proprietary knowledge and databases that we have. Um, all of the building staff kind of track a lot of the information on our tenants. Um, the incidents, kind of the se severe incidents, or if someone's kind of um, acting a little strange, we track that. We track renting, uh, if they pay the rent, um, a lot of the different stuff. And one of the things that we do with that is um, create a management index, which goes to the service providers and kind of say, these people are having a, a hard time. They may uh, be having issues. Can you give a little bit more service to that? Um, more to your question, uh, as well as kind of that stuff to help the tenants. Uh, we do track um, when they move on, uh, why they move on, uh, what, what are the issues that they had before, um, to either see if we could have predicted it. Um, and when, I, when you say move on, um, there's two different ways that uh, there is moving on. There are people that uh, kind of say, I wanna become more independent, have my own housing. Uh, New York City, it's really hard for these people to get affordable housing elsewhere. So we do have a lot of people that are staying in. Um, but then kind of the issue that we're running up into now is um, because they're staying in so long, we do have an aging population. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to get more resources towards that uh, aging population. Uh, the baby boom actually has an effect on us and we're actually seeing our death rate going up because of that. Um, so that kind of shapes what we're doing and we're trying to develop more tenant services around that type of individual. Thanks. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there's um, um, an application process that um, anyone you approach has to go through, mm -hmm. and uh, documentation is uh, a necessary part of that. Yeah. What happens to illegal uh, homeless populations? That's a really difficult population. Um, there is, uh, uh, if you're undocumented, you cannot get Section 8 or any kind of rental subsidy. So um, we do have transitional housing where we have, if you're homeless and you're on the streets and you're undocumented, we're going to work with you like any other uh, homeless individual. When you come into our transitional housing, we have a really big problem. And um, I don't know what the percentage is. I don't, I have, do, you, do you have any idea? 10%? Not even? Okay. So somewhere somewhere under 10% of our, our population um, is undocumented and they are stuck. Uh, we have uh, a certain amount of money that we actually uh, work with um, one and soon to be two churches in Brooklyn uh, to provide uh, how, housing. It's temporary, but it's long-term temporary housing for uh, undocumented folks. But, but that remains a challenge. Hi, um, thanks so much for your presentation. It was sure. great. Um, I um, had a question just in looking at the presentation um, that you, mo you know, you mostly provide sort of studio, small studio spaces. Mm -hmm. And in the case maybe with homeless families are like, you know, most, you know, of course, mm -hmm. because communities of color are multi-generational, you know, how do you yeah. manage that? And then I guess my next question was, um, I really appreciated your, you know, talking about these metrics that you use to, um, you know, really uh, measure like what, uh, you know, what communities actually need affordable housing. Um, with the example that you showed with, you know, Jamaica and East New York, et cetera. And what are other metrics that you can use to measure like future displacement of people in neighborhoods? Sure. Um, with respect to families, I mean, I will say that the the bulk of Common Ground's history has been in single adults. And uh, funding for supportive housing for single adults um, has just been more abundant and simpler. Having said that, last uh, fall, we partnered with our primary social service partner in a building that they actually developed, uh, which is a mix of uh, families and singles. So it was our first kind of dip into to family housing. And we did uh, determine that in order to uh, work to end homelessness, homelessness in New York City, it did not make sense for us to be only focusing on singles. So we are in our pipeline. We do have planned to do both uh, supportive housing for families and affordable housing for families. Affordable housing, by definition, standalone affordable housing can't only be for singles. So that will be for families as well. Um, 
with respect to metrics and how else we uh, can measure uh, the displacement. Do you, uh, did you hear that question, Keith? What was the question again? I'm sorry. Well, I was just Mm. Oh, the homeless. Yeah, that's a good one. Or when people are spending fifty percent or more mm -hmm. of their income on, on housing, and then I guess the other one was overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, the Furman Center. I don't know if it's. Uh, and oh, it's NYU. Sorry. Um, they actually have a lot of information on these populations. Uh, the one that we use is, was overcrowding because eventually that's going to either strain the relationship, and someone's going to. Uh, be turned out to the street eventually um, and then the rent burden um, it's everywhere except New York it's kind of considered that you should pay like 30% of your rent or 30% of your income towards rent most of us don't and it actually puts a, a huge burden so eventually they're just going to run out of money uh, those are a couple of the easy me metrics that we used because they were so readily available through this um, there are other things that we could have used but it just seemed like those were the two main factors that were that would kind of say you're most likely to become homeless. You know, the other two things I want to add, one that Beth just mentioned is a really good point. Every year the city does their HOPE count, which is the house, uh, Homeless Outreach Population Estimate count. It's done in the last Monday of January, where uh, about 1,500 volunteers, some of you could have participated, I don't know, um, go out and literally count how many people are out on the streets of, of New York. Um, that count is used to help uh, determine whether the homeless, the street homeless population is going up or it's going down, and then it impacts resources that the city and the state appropriate towards these services. So, um, you know, and, and this is very important for us because we, we do the outreach in, in, in a lot of the city. The other thing, um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, um, yeah, the other thing is uh, whether, Hold on, it's late. <laughs> I had it a second ago. Oh, yes, the, the three neighborhoods that we picked to uh, focus on in our strategic plan, which was East New York, uh, the South Bronx, and, and Jamaica, are all uh, neighborhoods that have, o uh, have, for the last several years, always been in the top 10 neighborhoods that feed into the family shelter system in the city. So if you're, if you're a family and you're claiming homelessness, there's a particular intake center that you go to in the Bronx. Um, and the city tracks where you've come from and where you, were, where you were last housed. So we specifically picked neighborhoods that have been traditionally and continue to be those kind of feeders into the homeless system. And that was another, another uh, metric that we used. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. And I had a couple questions uh, regarding, you were talking about the dwindling resources at the federal and state level mm -hmm. uh, for government funding. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering just about your general operational budget annually and sure. the programmatic uh, versus administrative uh, and fundraising overhead mm -hmm. and then uh, sort of along with your strategic plan, has, has there been a scaling up of your fundraising efforts? And what are your top fundraising uh, streams, uh, revenue streams? Sure. Um, so our operating budget is approximately $36 million. That is just the nonprofit portion. Each of our buildings is, is an LP because it has investors. It's actually a for-profit entity, but it breaks even every year. Um, it, never, it never makes any money. It just it sustains itself. Um, with that, our budget, including the LPs, it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. It's about $50 million annual budget. Um, about 50% of that comes from government contracts that we have. Um, another 35% or so comes from tenant rent, so from low-income rents that are coming into us. Um, and then fundraising is, a, is about 10% of our budget. Um, uh, to answer your question about what, of our, what are kind of our plans for the future as we see this, this changing, uh, we are definitely looking to increase <coughs> philanthropic dollars. Uh, it's, they're just, they're really important. 
Um, and we're trying to do more with less, and that's what goes back to, kind of brings us back to operational efficiencies. Um, and if we cluster buildings, can we share program staff um, a across a few different buildings? Um, you know, uh, it, it takes, you know, uh, a really solid staff to, to keep a, a building with 300 people um, stable and functioning like any other high-end building that you'd see in Manhattan, which is what you'd feel if you came into our buildings. And that's because we have, uh, we do have a number of staff at all times on site. So we are looking to um, to cut costs in, in areas that will not, uh, not lower the bar in any way um, and to increase our fundraising dollars. Uh, and in terms of uh, who our biggest funders are, we, uh, we do quite well in the corporate and foundation area um, through banks and, and you know, Robinhood is our, is our biggest private funder uh, found, uh, foundation. And uh, we are looking and going to be working very hard to increase our individual donor base. I'd say that, it, you know, if, that, if there's one weakness on Common Ground's end when it comes to fundraising, it's on the individual end. And um, uh, the individual giving versus corporate and foundation is really quite different. Um, corporations and foundations uh, are donate Primarily, our experience has been to particular projects. They want to see particular outcomes, which is all fine and great. Um, but one of the things that we have in our buildings is 24-hour security. It's very important. The security in our buildings are the eyes and ears. Like Keith was saying, um, we, we track, you know, uh, kind of everything there is to track about our tenants to make sure that we're that our programming and, and our model evolves ever so slightly to, to make sure that we're meeting folks needs so our security guards will actually uh, write up a report if they see somebody sitting in the lobby for too long or staring out the window for too long it's not a major incident but it is something to let the staff know you know mr jones didn't look quite right today um, it is very important. It is not something that uh, foundations find particularly sexy to fund to to uh, provide funding for. Individual donors tend to, if they think the organization is doing good work and they can give you hundred dollars, they write you a check for hundred dollars, and that goes into the core operations of, of the organization. So that is where we're going to be really focusing. You're welcome. Thank you for your presentation. It was really great. Sure. And I have a question: um, Is there any um, in the terms of legal policy, any anything that prevents your organization to work better? Are there any obstacles that, uh, let's say, in from the um, government policies that prevent you um, or that you could work better um, if they would be changed? Well, I think that, that probably the, I don't know if any of you have have thoughts on this, but I, I mean, from my perspective, one of the biggest challenges around government funding um, is that the funding is tied to a particular type of person, a particular diagnosis. So, so there is an, a, a, a huge funding stream. It's called the New York New York Agreements. It was a there, there were several. There was New York New York one, two, three, and we're hoping there'll be a New York New York four. But essentially, it's the state and the city coming together. To, uh, to the city puts in 50%, the state puts in 50% to provide dollars, to provide services to uh, people with special needs. Those people with special needs have to be diagnosed in a certain way. So for example, there's a category that is for folks that have severe and persistent mental illness. That means that when we're working with that homeless person on the street, we have to have a psychiatrist come out wherever they are um, work with the person and write a r report that diagnoses them with this particular type of um, mental illness. If they don't fall into that bucket, they don't get that funding. It makes it very challenging sometimes when somebody is, uh, you know, has uh, some mental illness and has a substance abuse problem and has, you know, uh, challenges to housing and cannot remain stably housed and needs our help but but doesn't fall into one of those specific buckets. So so that is definitely uh, something that is a, that it, that can be a barrier for us. Okay, thank you very much. Oh. Thanks. Thanks.